Okay, so for the last talk today, uh, we're going to listen to Theo McKenzie, who is going to tell us about uh, many nodal domains, in, many nodal domains in random regular graphs. So the virtual floor is yours. Thank you. And yeah, thanks uh, everyone for coming, for, for sticking around for this last talk. I really appreciate it. Um, also, uh, I definitely want this to be, I, I don't want this to be overwhelmingly confusing. So definitely if you have any questions, let me know. Um, and yeah, I'll try to be as uh, clear as possible during the talk. Oh, and sorry, I should say that this is this was joint work with uh, Shoshendu Ganguly, Siddharth Mohansi, and Nikhil Sarvastava, um, who are all with me at, at UC Berkeley. Okay, so a good place to start thinking about nodal domains uh, is Perron's nodal domain theorem, uh, which says that if I take uh, the kth smallest Dirichlet eigenfunction uh, of uh, for the Laplacian on some smooth bounded uh, domain in RD, that if I look at the zero set of this eigenfunction, then this partitions my domain into at most k components. Uh, so you can just see an example, a very simple example that I generated in MATLAB of the six eigenfunction of the square. Uh, so these components are, are what we call nodal domains. So we see six nodal domains below, and uh, they've been used for, for a very long time, uh, like 150, 200 years, uh, as a way to figure out structure of eigenfunctions. Like it's a way to, to measure like what are these eigenfunctions? So what I'm gonna be talking about today is a discrete version of this problem, uh, which is on a graph. Uh, so if I have a graph, then the nodal domains of a vector on the vertices of the graph are the maximal connected components that are all of the same size. Uh, so an example here is I have a, a tree graph so just a set of vertices that I've connected by edges. And I have some vector on the vertices. So you can see that on each vertex, I've, I've given some number, which just corresponds to uh, the value in the vector. So uh, once again, like uh, these are either positive or, or negative. And then what the nodal domains are, are I, uh, you can think about it as coloring the vertices according to whether it's positive or negative in the vector. And then the nodal domains are just the maximal connected components all of the same size. Um, yeah, so here I have four nodal domains. So just another example here, uh, I have uh, a graph uh, just on four vertices and I have a vector of uh, values on the, on the vertices. And then the nodal domains are just once again, the maximally connected components all of the same size. The definition clear. I, Great, so uh, what uh, vectors are, are we concerned with? What we'll be looking at is the, uh, the adjacency matrix of the graph, right? So I can encode information uh, of my graph in a matrix where rows and columns correspond to the vertices. And then I put a one if two vertices are connected by an edge and a zero if two vertices are not connected uh, by an edge. Um, and uh, the idea of uh, spectral graph theory is that um, a somewhat surprising amount of information about the original graph can be deduced from this adjacency matrix. Uh, so some things to note are that uh, this matrix is symmetric, which means that the eigenvalues of the matrix are real. Uh, and uh, I, I should note that if uh, there's a notion of the Laplacian on this on a graph, uh, which is just uh, D minus A, where D is the diagonal matrix of degrees. Uh, so all, all of this last point to say is that this adjacency matrix is very much related uh, to the Laplacian of the, of the graph. Okay, so uh, this problem about graph nodal domains is something that's been studied uh, for a while. And, and I want to highlight uh, some, uh, a brief history of, of certain results uh, to do with it. Uh, so uh, Fiedler showed it in 1975 uh, that uh, if I take a tree graph, so a graph uh, of a tree, so there are no cycles, that the kth smallest eigenvalue uh, has exactly, of the Laplacian, has exactly k nodal domains. Okay, um, more recently, uh, Davies et al. showed that um, a discrete version of Courant's nodal domain theorem, which says that uh, the kth eigenvector 
has at most k nodal domains. And then uh, Gregory Berkeleko uh, gave a generalization of these two results in 2008, um, saying that if I have a tree graph and then I add L edges to that tree graph, uh, then if I look at the kth eigenvector of a Schrodinger operator, if you're unsure what a discrete Schrodinger operator is, you can just think about the, the combinatorial Laplacian again, uh, that it has between k minus L and k nodal. Okay, so I, Thinking about these results, I, we have this uh, general upper bound on the number of uh, nodal domains, and we have a lower bound, but the lower bound gets weaker as we add edges, right? So this, so this last result, every edge that we add, the, the result gets weaker. So uh, a, a question is, can we lower bound the number of nodal domains uh, for graphs that have many edges? So uh, a natural question is, uh, if I generate my graph at random, then uh, can I say anything about its nodal domains? Uh, this this will this idea comes up a lot, right? Like oftentimes we can't show things through general graphs, so instead we'll try to generate a graph at random and figure out properties of the graph. So the uh, first uh, random graph model for which this was studied uh, was what's known as the erdos ringing model, uh, and this says that I I take n vertices, so I fix all these points. There are n choose two potential edges just by choosing any pair of vertices. And then I just say, well, for every pair of edges, I, uh, or for every pair of vertices, I include the edge with some fixed probability P. Um, so uh, I take vertices and then I just add each edge independently with some fixed probability. Uh, so this is, uh, this is often called like a GNP graph. Uh, so here's an example that I just generated uh, of G10 one half, which is just a graph on 10 vertices where each edge is included with probability one half. Okay, so uh, once again, there's there's a robust line of work on, on this problem. Uh, so uh, Deco, Lee, and Lineal in 2011 uh, showed that uh, if I look at the adjacency matrix of this graph uh, and I count the number of nodal domains that almost all vertices uh, are contained in exactly two nodal domains. So what they showed is that the structure that we have is that I have these two gigantic nodal domains that contain all but a constant number of vertices, and then potentially I have some small vertices elsewhere, not included. Okay, uh, so the, the next result is that, in fact, these, vert these extra spare vertices don't exist. We just have exactly two nodal domains that uh, one positive one and one negative. Uh, okay, then uh, Mark Rudelson showed that with high probability, every vertex neighbors the nodal domain of the opposite sign. And then more recently, Han Huang and Mark Rudelson showed that um, for basically, they, they gave two regimes, um, but the, the idea is that uh, these two nodal domains are approximately the same size for almost all eigenvectors, right? So we have a very good idea of what uh, our nodal domains look like based on these results for this randomly generated graph. Uh, that we have exactly two nodal domains, that they're almost exactly the same size, and that each vertex neighbors the opposing uh, nodal domain. Okay, so so what is this? What does this mean, right? Well, the, the the general notion is that if once again I'm including each edge with an independent probability. The notion that we're seeing here is that if P is too high. So for example, if P is polynomial, so n to the minus C, then the graph is too dense to have non-trivial nodal domain structure. Um, however, there are other random graph models which are sparser than the erdos renyi model. And the, the most common of these is, is what's known as the random regular graph model, uh, which I'll talk about in the next slide. But the uh, based on simulations, uh, Decali and Lineal showed that, uh, or they they did ran simulations and showed that for a, a deregular graph on a fixed number of vertices, that the number of nodal domains actually increases with the index of the eigenvector. So uh, this is something that I uh, once again just generated on my computer, um, and the x-axis is the index of the eigenvector, and the y-axis is the number of nodal domains. And what we can see is that, you know, after, uh, after some number, the, uh, 
the it looks like the number of nodal domains increases linearly. Um, specifically, if I if I look at the uh, the rightmost edge, right, then um, there are, there are many many nodal domains. So the reason why it was tricky to prove this, right? Remember this this was just a simulation, is that uh, we can't use the independence of edges anymore. Um, remember that the erdos freddy case, like every edge was included independently. Um, and then there are some, some very nice uh, delocalization structure of eigenvector uh, uh, results that we can use there. Um, nevertheless, what we wanted to do is show that for this sparser model, for the random regular graph model, uh, that there are many nodal domains. Okay, so what is this model? We can just think about it as the following that I look at uh, for a fixed number of vertices. I look at all graphs such that each vertex neighbors the same number of other vertices, right? So this is just the, the degree, that's what we call the degree and, and we call a graph where the degree of each vertex is the same, uh, a regular graph. So uh, the random regular graph model is just, I look at all graphs, um, that are um, are uh, are deregular and on a fixed number of vertices, and I just choose one at random. And by at random, do you mean uniformly? Yeah, you sorry, uniformly. Let let me uh, shift gears a little bit um, and talk a little bit about another reason why we're interested in this problem for for this specific model for the random regular graph. So the motivation comes from uh, mathematical physics. Um, and the idea of uh, quantum billiards. So um, there's this uh, famous result of Schneerman uh, who showed that in this uh, quantum billiard system, uh, almost all high energy eigenfunctions are equidistributed. Once again, I'm going to be a little bit, you know, big picture here. Yes. Um, then uh, uh, Barry had this conjecture that um, in the high energy limit, uh, we won't just have uh, like almost all being equidistributed, there is going to be this uh, stronger structure, which is uh, known as the random wave conjecture, which is which says that the if I look at the eigenfunction, the high energy eigenfunctions, that the statistics of these eigenfunctions are going to emulate the statistics of uh, a Gaussian random variables. And what will the uh, covariance of two points be? The covariance of two points is just going to be uh, this Bessel function. So the general idea here is that um, if I look at an if I look at a high energy eigenfunction for quantum billiards, and I take two points, uh, then the statistics related to those two points are going to be the statistics of Gaussian random variables with some fixed covariance. Okay, so one implication of uh, Barry's conjecture is that uh, these eigenfunctions would have many nodal domains. Uh, just from this from this random behavior. Um, so another reason why we're interested in this question is in the discrete version, if we could show that there are many nodal domains, then um, this would what be be suggest in some way uh, various conjecture in the discrete case. Okay, so um, once again, that was in continuous space, but um, discrete graphs and specifically regular graphs have been used for over 20 years um, as models of quantum chaos. Um, and in these models, instead of uh, looking at the high energy limit, uh, we often send the number of vertices to infinity, and examine eigenvectors of the adjacency matrix. Okay, so, so um, an example and a very prominent result in this line is one of Anantha Raman and Lemassan in 2015, who showed an analogous statement to Schneerman's theorem for large regular graphs which is once again, the equidistribution of, of eigenvectors in this. So as I said before, um, we want to show that there are many nodal domains to support this discrete version of Barry's conjecture. Okay, so um, yeah, let me move now to, to the result that we actually showed. So what we showed is that if we look at, once again, the adjacency matrix, and I fix the degree of my graph, and some constant alpha, which we'll, we'll set to be very small. Uh, then with high probability, every eigenvector with small enough eigenvalue has an almost linear number of nodal domains, has 
omega n over poly log n nodal domains. Um, so, okay. So the first question is, let's uh, let's break this down, right? So the first thing is, well, how many eigenvalues am I actually talking about? Like, if if there were no eigenvalues in this regime, then this uh, you know, this result wouldn't mean anything. So um, we know what the limiting spectral measure of random regular graphs is, and this means that there are approximately some constant times g to the minus three halves times n eigenvalues in this interval. So uh, here's another uh, plot that I did. Here's the limiting spectral measure of three regular uh, ra random regular graphs. And this red region is uh, the regime for which our result holds. However, as you can see, as d gets bigger and bigger, our result gets uh, corresponds to a smaller and smaller portion of the spectral measure. For example, when d equals 40, it only corresponds to this small sliver over here. So once again, this is the limiting sp spectral measure for three regular and then for 40 regular and regular graphs. Okay, and uh, uh, this, yes. Uh, uh, Dima Jacobson, I have a question. Uh, so in the simulation, uh, yeah, there was a interval for which there were two nodal domains for regular graph, right? Which yes. like the graph was flat. Now, uh, in your case, it looks like uh, it starts growing right away. Uh, no, sorry. So, so you're right. This is confusing because everything has been flipped. Uh, uh, okay. So, so uh, the the two is in the high energy sort of two towards the right in the picture you're showing now. Yeah. So, so yeah. I guess the the thing is that um, yeah, that's that's very fair. And part of the the confusion is basically because um, this is looking at a right, which is just the adjacency matrix. And where the index goes from right to left to kind of emulate D minus A, which is the little Plotian. Um, but yeah, so. Ah, so yeah, yeah, okay, okay, okay. So, so you flip adjacency and Laplacian. Sorry, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. and, and can you say anything about two, uh, like the, the flat part? Well, regular I mean, or like slow, relatively sparse growing degree, whatever. Yeah, so I guess your question is that. For the left-hand side, mm. um, can we say anything like an upper bound on the number of nodal domains? Yeah. Right. It, uh, no, so two is obviously a trivial lower bound. And then we have the index of the eigenvector as, as an upper bound uh, from the previous results that we said. Um, what I would uh, imagine would happen is that for if I look at large enough graphs, if my index is uh, linear, so basically if I'm bounded away from the left part, uh, my what I would conjecture is that if I'm bounded away from the uh, the right hand side of the spectrum, I would have a linear number of nodal domains, mm -hmm. but just like the the constant would be very very small, right? And too small to see for a thousand regular graphs, um, and yeah. That's that's what I would think, and hopefully, yeah, I'll I'll get to why I would think that too. All right, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Okay, so once again, this is the first result: lower bounding the number of nodal domains in random regular. Okay, and yeah, as we were just discussing, uh, a and the and the Laplacian d minus a have the same eigenvectors if I graph as regular. Uh, this is because the diagonal uh, matrix of degrees is a multiple of the identity; it's just d times the identity in this, if my graph is regular. Uh, so what we can rephrase our result as is saying that if I look at the high energy eigenvectors of the Laplacian, uh, then those have many nodal domains in the, for random regular. Okay, so uh, more the way, how do we actually do this? So what we actually do is that we look at the number of singleton nodal domains, which are the nodal domains that are only one vertex. And just by counting these, we show that the number of these is omega n over poly log n. Okay, so to be clear, what I mean by a singleton uh, nodal domain is when I look at the eigenvector, I, I just count the number of vertices that are, for example, positive, but all their neighbors are negative in the eigenvector. Or of course, the reverse, negative and all their neighbors are positive. Um, uh, the example on the right, of course, is not a singleton nodal domain because it has a neighbor of the same. Okay, so how do uh, how do we do this? Uh, we actually split this into two cases. So once again, this this is 
uh, a statement about structure of eigenvectors. So um, we split it into different cases about other types of structure. Um, so we say an eigenvector is delocalized if there's a linear number of vertices that have a non-trivial amount of mass on them. Uh, and we split, basically our theorem has two cases. One is if the eigenvector is delocalized and the other is if it's localized. Um, then the idea is that if the eigenvector is delocalized, uh, we, we use results concerning the proximity of an eigenvector to a, to a Gaussian. And I'll talk more about that. And then if the eigenvector is localized, then we can argue using the local structure of random regular graphs. So I'll only have time to talk about this first, first point today, but definitely if you have any questions about the second one, let's talk about this. Uh, so uh, so what, does a, what does a random regular graph look like? So with high probability, if I look at a, a randomly generated regular graph, there are a small number of, of small cycles. Uh, and the notion here is that if I take a vertex, uh, if I look at the neighborhood of a graph and I look at the, uh, the boundary of the neighborhood, I'm much more likely to connect outside of that neighborhood than inside. So what this means is that almost everywhere, a random regular graph will locally look like a tree. Um, and technically what this means is that if I look at the benjamin Schramm limit of a sequence of random regular graphs, it will converge to the infinite tree. So recall the, uh, the equation for covariance and various conjecture. Um, and what I want you to take away is that uh, it's based on the eigenvalue and then the distance uh, between the two points. And intuitively, what's, what we should expect is that as two points get further and further away from each other, then we would expect their covariance to decrease. So uh, and in, if we want an analogous statement on, uh, for graphs, that would mean that uh, the individual entries of the eigenvector are Gaussian and that their covariance should depend on their distance. Again, we have this local convergence of tree-like structure. So what we want to do is understand covariance in the infinite tree. Okay, so uh, in fact, the, the way should, we should be thinking about this is that we're already quite restricted because we want Gaussian behavior and we want an eigenvector to satisfy the eigenvector equation. Uh, so, uh, Elon showed in 2009 that there's, in fact, only one uh, joint Gaussian distribution uh, that has all the properties that we want. And this is called the Gaussian wave. So exactly what we're talking about here is, um, let's think about, just as, a, as an example, what do we want the covariance of two neighboring vertices to be, right? X0 and uh, X1. Well. I know that uh, to satisfy the eigenvalue equation, let's just say that these are all Gaussians, right? So if I, if I want to satisfy the eigenvalue equation, that I sort of need x origin to equal the sum of its neighbors times x origin times lambda. Okay, so I multiply both sides by xo. And then the other thing that I want is that I want this to be automorphism invariant. So really on the right, these are just all copies of x uh, oh, I sorry, but we take the expectation of both sides. And then, yes, I, I want each of these on the right-hand side to be uh, copies of just XO times X1. Um, so that should give me lambda. So really, this should just be, uh, this gives me the covariance of uh, XO and X1. Okay, so I only have a few more minutes, but I think I only have a few more slides, so that's fine. So uh, this means that if uh, Barry's conjecture were true in the discrete case, the covariances should be those of the Gaussian wave. And uh, Backhouse and Segedi actually prove a form of this. And uh, what they show is that uh, this is uh, kind of a, a, you know, a lot, a lot to, to say, but with, uh, for arbitrarily high constant probability, a random regular graph has the following property. If I look at, uh, if I fix some number R and then I look at the R neighborhood of a vertex, then 
just uniformly random sampling of vertex gives me a distribution over RNA branches. And what they show is that that distribution is, uh, once again, at most epsilon, so arbitrary small, close to the distribution that we would get for the Gaussian blade. So once again, I have two distributions here. On the left, I have sampling of vertex uniformly at random. And on the right, I have the Gaussian wave. So these are just Gaussians with some fixed covariance. And what they show is that these distributions are, if I up to some scalar multiple, are arbitrarily close together. Okay, so this is great, right? Like, this is exactly what we want because the Gaussian wave, we can just calculate it and show that there's some constant probability that a vertex will be isolated, right? A vertex will have the opposite sign of all these neighbors. However, there's one pitfall here, which is that, like I said, there's some scalar multiple that we have to worry about, which corresponds to the variance. So if the variance of the Gaussian wave that we're close to is zero, then we can't say anything about the number of nodal domains, because all we know is that uh, the distribution that we have is close to a Gaussian wave of variance zero, which is you know, obviously completely flat, so we can't say anything about it. Uh, yeah, and yeah, that's the point I'm trying to make it long. So the idea here is that being close to variant zero is the same as being close to uh, being localized. This localization condition that I showed before, variant zero, like having the distribution of entries of a of my eigenvector being close to a Gaussian of variant zero is saying that almost all of my entries are very, very close to zero, uh, which corresponds to localization. However, if it's my eigenvector is delocalized, then the then the result is done. Okay. Uh, and so basically we solve this problem if our eigenvector is delocalized. And then there are other techniques that we have to use if our eigenvector is local. Um, but yeah, like I said, if you have questions about that, um, let me know. Okay, uh, so let me just say very briefly, uh, if we just show, if we can show uh, delocalization for eigenvectors, then we wouldn't have to worry about the second step. So that would be very appealing. Uh, and that would imply uh, the answer to the question that I said previously, that in fact, if I'm bounded away from uh, the second, the edge of my uh, spectral measure, then there would be many, um, uh, there would be many nodal domains. And in fact, uh, we would also be able to predict uh, how many there would be across. Let me, yeah, let me just uh, say, we could also talk about Erdos Rainy graphs in the same way. Um, if the if we just set p very small, that's another example of the sparse model. Um, but yeah, that's all I want to say. Once again, thanks a lot for inviting me. Thanks a lot, uh, Theo, for this talk. Um, I, it's now time for uh, the last time of the day for questions. So, does anybody have uh, any question for Theo? Another remark: uh, the results uh, by Nazarov, Sodin, and others about nodal domains for random spherical harmonics and generally random func uh, random like linear combinations of functions. And what they, the geometry is kind of similar to what you are saying. So in your case, there are many isolated vertices, which are nodal domains. And in their case, they have uh, many nodal domains, which are, you know, roughly like ovals on the scale of one wavelength, which is, somewhat similar and I think the proof is actually also somewhat similar so uh, they they show that with positive probability uh, the, there is uh, like a, a point where the value is positive and then everywhere outside the value is negative so it, the nodal domain has to be contained in the in that ball and there are many such balls but but uh, so there are some sort of maybe superficial similarities between uh, nodal domains for random uh, spherical harmonics and such, and uh, nodal domains in your case. Yes. yes. No, so, so I wasn't, who were the authors again? I, I don't... Uh, Nazarov and Sodin. Okay. So, so oh. but but this is, this is a continuous case, and yeah. it's, uh, it, it's, it's sort of, it's random linear combinations. It's not uh, 
uh, random regular graphs. So, so it's a, it's it's different, of course. But, but yeah, no, but I but I definitely wanted to say like something that I that I touched on in the talk and something that I find really fascinating is this connection between discrete and continuous, right? Like the fact that you know there's this discrete version of of theorem and theorem, um, or these related results. It's it's very enticing. Um, so so yeah, no, I'll definitely look that up. Thanks, uh, Dima, for the remark. Do we have any other questions for Theo? Um, I've, I've got one myself. Um, so, so you've talked to us today a lot about this, um, the, these deregular graphs and compared them to this uh, Erdős-Rényi model in the beginning, where we have very different behaviors in terms of uh, how nodal sets behave. Is, is there some sort of phase transition, some sort of intermediate model where we go from one to the other? Is this something that's, that's uh, known or studied, uh, how, yeah. how, how we go? Yeah, so that's Any, a really good question. So yeah, I ran out of time, so I couldn't really talk about this. But this is your question is actually um, been suggested by Ronan Aldon, Han Huang, and, and Mark Rudelson that if I take P to be small enough, then mm -hmm. there could be many nodal domains in this regime. Mm -hmm. And the um, the thing about uh, this regime, uh, C log n over n, this is exactly the critical level for connectivity. So what this mm -hmm. means is that this is exactly when we're going to see sparse components. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the other point that I should make is that um, if, if my degree is large enough, then mm -hmm. a random regular graph and a random uh, erdos renyi graph will look almost the same. Uh, like there's this result of, there's this recent result of, of Pugao and, and other off authors that says that um, I can actually, um, there's a, a pairing between the erdos renyi and the random regular graph models um, such that Almost all edges are contained from one to the to the next. Um, but yeah, it's funny because this um, really the key to this uh, random regular graph behavior is this uh, idea of the uh, the infinite tree, right? It's this Benjamin E. Schramm limit. Um, mm -hmm. So one idea would be to study the um, the Benjamin E. Schramm limit of, of this uh, the sparse Erdos-Renyi graph, which is this. Um, right, but it's it's much harder to analyze. It's much less nice because it's not a regular tree anymore. Uh, but yeah, that uh, I yeah I, I would probably expect some kind of phase transition to answer your question. Mm -hmm. All right, maybe have time for one more question if uh, anyone has any. Yeah. Um, so here it looks like the um, the limit, if I understood well, the limiting factor when D was larger in your theorem was that your window was kind of uh, yeah. the left. But it, so uh, is it, this is because of the uh, localization, the localization thing? Yeah, so, so, so actually that's in the, that's a good question. Um, and that's actually in the part of the proof that it didn't show. So that's in the localization part. Um, so the idea there uh, very briefly is Okay, let's assume that our graph is, uh, our eigenvector is localized, right? So that means that it only has large value on a few vertices. So that means that without changing my um, eigenvector too much, I can remove almost all of the vertices. Um, really like looking at the quadratic form, I don't change the quadratic form if I remove a lot of my vertices. But this means that I have, um, a, once again, this tree-like structure. Um, and the thing is that, um, let's see, basically, like, if I, if I assume that I don't have many nodal domains, then I can show that um, it's actually, uh, that means that every vertex neighbors vertex of the same sign. So I can remove that edge and once again, only uh, decrease the quadratic form. So we have a, a D minus one regular tree. So basically what our result says is that for any eigenvalue that has that is less than the spectral radius of a negative, the spectral radius of a D minus one regular tree, I can show this result by, by, some, by some comparison. And the point is, is that um, the difference between the spectral radius of a D regular tree and a D minus one regular tree gets worse as the degree grows. Um, yeah, I, do, I realized that was confusing. Uh, you know, I would, I would need more time to fully explain it, but. Uh, that's like the general idea that's that's going on.
but it's really helpful could, to look do like. Do you think you could hope, hope to like uh, prove that there's a certain like non-zero proportion of uh, eigen like, eigenvalues which are not localized in certain regimes or something like that? Yeah, I mean, at the at the end, I think almost all this will be true for almost all eigenvalues. Um, but yeah, I mean, like I like I said, this has been um, you know this is this is proved to be hard. I've been worked on for for a while, but I would I, this is this is the behavior that I would expect that for almost all eigenvalues, I have a non-trivial number of node limits. Basically, that the the backhouse and Segedi result fully describes eigenvectors would be the, the even bigger, uh, yeah, idea. Well, thank you very much. All right. Thanks a lot for the question. So uh, thanks, everybody, for uh, joining us uh, today in the uh, Young Researchers in Spectral Geometry Conference. Thanks to you again for uh, the talk. I think we can thank all the speakers uh, from today.